Quality pasture can be the secret to healthy animals, abundant gardens, and a, a vigorous growth of prosperity on your homestead. I'm Justin Hitt with the newsletter Prosperity Homestead, and today we're going to talk about how to transform your land into pasture, primarily for small animals or for uh, that transition from an idle piece of land into a garden or growing space. So first off, we have to, every piece of land starts a different way. So we have to observe the land as it is. So is it fallow land? Is it forest land? Is it a field? Is it dry lands? Um, for example, if it was a forest, in the case of a, some of the videos that we've been covering on the YouTube channel, the forest that we're working with is actually a very young forest with a minimal number of large trees. And we were able to use a forest mulcher to come down. Now, another property I worked with actually had a mature forest that was overaged. It was like 30, 40 year old forest, a lot of uh, degraded soil underneath, trees were falling over. So we forested that land. But if you're going to go from forest to pasture, you, you want to ask the question of productivity. So the forest, a young forest, captures a lot of carbon. It sequesters this carbon, it provides uh, forage and vegetation for goats, it provides uh, shelter for small animals. You may have a, a five acre piece of property and two acres is in forest. You may find that another area of the land would be better to turn into pasture than the area that's in forest. If it's an older forest, you may be getting near the time where it's going to get forested anyway. And so it can be a field after it's been forested. But if it's a young forest, you may find it more uh, accessible and more profitable to simply put trails through the forested area to make access, access better when you have a mature tree set and then to run smaller animals in a forested setting. So that's your, your, your goats, your uh, pigs, um, other small animals like that. Now, if you've got two acres, that's different than if you have 25 acres. If you have 25 acres, 50 acres, 100 acres of forest, especially young forest, you can run larger animals that would normally be on pasture, but using a system called silvopasture, where you retain forests on contour lines through the large growing area, and then there's uh, bands of pasture in between the tree sets. So again, there is a lot of depends, but the key factors of turning anything into a pasture, into a grazing area where you can sustain uh, anything from goats, sheep, uh, uh, pigs on pasture, uh, cows on pasture, are, is five simple steps. So we're going to go over those steps. So first off, you want to slow and spread water. Erosion is the enemy of both forests and pasture areas. If you have moving, fast moving water across any surface of soil, you're gonna have ditching and erosion. So what you wanna first focus on, and there's a lot of ways of doing it, but slowing and spreading that water could be as simple as, as ripping contour ditches into your field. It could be uh, swales. It could be uh, uh, brush dams, for example, we've done in some areas. The key is, is you want water to slow and then soak into the ground. This is because your pasture is going to pasture is going to require a large amount of water in order to sustain the grasses and different things that will grow there. And that water is necessary so that you have the nutrient cycles. Uh, so the humidity near the soil level, so the grasses can get deep roots, uh, so that you have uh, the loose and irritable soil to provide those calories to capture the carbon and turn it to food for for your animals. Uh, but again, that water's got to slow and sp slow down. It's got to spread out. Now it can't be on the surface. It can't be wet. You know, you're not building a marsh here. You're building a pasture. Now, if you do find that the land doesn't drain well. There are things you can do down that line because you don't want standing water uh, unless you're doing a, a rice paddy. You know, you could a different form of pasture could be a, uh, a multi-use rice paddy area, but that's more of a tropical climate. But again, slow and spread that water. 
hold as much soil in place. This means that any nutrients you add to the land over time, whether it be manures or fertilizers or limes or, or calcium or anything like that, uh, it stays on your land. Number two, soil pH matters. For a pasture, you're going to want to have a soil pH between 6 and 7. This is kind of a neutral soil. And the soil pH allows the microbes in the soil to more readily uh, make nutrients available. So the plants, let's say you've got clay soil. The plants are going to have a, a limited uptake of nutrients in a clay soil because this clay soil does not facilitate the biology necessary to convert you know, rotting materials into plant nutrients. So when you change the soil pH, it opens up the clay, allowing deep rooted cover crops to start breaking that clay apart, which makes passageways so that water can soak into the ground. And you're now in a better condition to start doing pasture. Now you can leave the, the ground fallow. You can get the pH levels where they need to be. You can observe the weeds or, or anything that grows on the fallow field uh, to, to kind of get an idea of the zones that are there on your land. But you're still going to have to apply some kind of lime or remove, uh, depending on the soil. You know, if you could have a soil that's very acidic, adding lime brings it back to a neutral. But you could also have soil that's very base. So you need to look at these things. Now notice I didn't say anything about tillage. So we're slowing and spreading water. That could could be some earthworks. We're pH on the soil. We, I mentioned cover crops, uh, which is number three. You want to seed with a pasture blend or a cover crop, uh, depending on what the soil needs. But I didn't say anything about tilling. You don't need to till a field to get it to where it needs. Now, again, if you start it with a forest, you may need to grub out the, the stumps. You may want to grind those stumps and put them back on the field rather than burning those stumps because burning takes nutrients out of the soil. Uh, historically, people used to slash a forest and burn it. So they set the forest on fire and then go through the forest, knocking down all the materials onto the ground, which would then burn up and create ash. The ash did feed the soil, but very often you'd get undesirable plants. You'd get um, thistles and different things to growing in the field that were undesirable. Now, I know this is an anamorphic approach, but when I see land, I often see if you burn the land, it wants to protect itself. So it tends to grow off thorny uh, plants. Th those seeds tend to activate. Uh, land that's fallowed will tend to cover itself with nitrogen fixing plants because it's trying to build the nutrients in the soil to later sustain trees. We want to think about these things because when we slow and spread the water, when we get the soil pH right, when we start adding cover crops, we want to choose cover crops that feed the soil so that we don't have to haul in nitrogen and we don't have to haul in fertilizers. We also want multiple species of grasses because that's going to provide a more balanced diet for the animals, but the different species may grow in different soil conditions. So the larger the field is, the the more variety of soil conditions you have in the beginning, you want to make sure you're able to pick up grass here and there. And then you may want to include something like clover or alfalfa, uh, because that is going to add nutrients for your animals, but it's also going to add uh, nit fixed nitrogen in the soil. So you're going to, what I call a pasture blend might depend on your area, or it could be as easy as going down to Tractor Supply or, or Rural King and buying a bag that says pasture blend across it. The key is, is that a pasture is not just a field full of grass. In fact, it's, it could be highly nutrient, nutrient dense, a variety of cover crops, pigeon peas, soybeans, uh, it could be corn, it could be a lot of different things uh, with the intention to feed animals. So once you get your field together, uh, such as uh, you may want to cut it a few times, you may want to flail mow it a few times, but essentially we want to make sure there is a, a density of grass that is more than 50%. So if you took a square foot and you counted all of the pieces of grass there and then the approximate size of the piece of grass or the distance between the grass growing out of the ground, you want more than 50% of that area covered with grass before you start bringing on animals. So you want some density and this blanket covering the soil before you start putting pressure on it. And so what do you do instead of putting animals on it? Well, you might mow it, you might flail it, you might uh, drag it and then overseed it. So what I mean by dragging, it's, it's like a 
like a mesh that has spikes on it and you're going to drag it over the ground. It's kind of roughing up the ground and then you're going to seed it and then maybe you're going to run a roller over it so that you're going to get that good soil to seed contact. Now, I know I'm giving you a complete course here, but again, this is meant to be an overview, but it's important to understand it. You don't just get a pasture. You, you have to cultivate the pasture just as you would cultivate a garden or you would cultivate a, a flock of, of, of animals. Now, the reason we do this is because when we get to step four, where we're using rotational mob grazing, um, you have to understand the cycles of the grass itself so that you're not putting too much pressure on the land and causing it to get compacted again or to have uh, bare spots or to have too much of undesirable plants because the seeds are already there. If you burn the field, you're going to have seeds that remain are are tolerant to a wildfire. Um, if you till the field, you're going to be bringing up seeds that have been sitting dormant in the soil for years. Uh, you don't want honey locusts. You don't want brambles. You don't want things that are undesirable to your animals. So again, that observation is important. So what are we observing? When you start doing a rotational mob grazing, you're going to, you're, you have to balance between your ability to manage animals and their the capacity of the land. So what I'm not saying is go out and get 100 cattle and run it over the land. You have to know what your holding capacity is for each acre. And if you're just creating a pasture, you need to start smaller. So you might have five goats in a small pen moving across the land. You might have chickens in a chicken tractor moving across the land. You might have two cows that are in a smaller area being moved daily. But the key is, is that mob grazing is that a large number of animals in a small space for a short period of time. It starts tearing up the soil again while the animals are eating and processing the grasses that grow. So let's say you have a clover grass and alfalfa blend on the soil and the animals have come through and they've eaten it all off. You want to stop them before they get to the point where they destroy root systems. Because by facilitating the, the deep root, root growth, which we get with the pH balancing and the soils, uh, the, the water movement on the soil or the water uh, spreading on the soil, we also want the animal's disruption of that that plant system, not to destroy the roots of those um, those grasses, but instead allow for additional soakage, nutrient cycling. Um, sometimes the animals will come in and they'll, if you leave them on a large area, they'll be very selective about what they eat. But if you put them in a smaller area, they'll eat everything. You want them to eat a little bit of everything, process that through the digestive system, and then crap it out. Now, your soil may be deficient in minerals. Your soil may be deficient in other nutrients. Instead of putting those nutrients directly on your pasture, you feed those to the animals. So now you're, you're creating healthier meat. You're uh, mineralizing your animals, and then the animals are distributing that waste across the entire pro property. Joel Salaston's a good source there. Um, there's a couple other individuals that if you write in, we'll get you the resources. Uh, the key to understand here is that it's a controlled disruption of the land. We're not tilling the land. We're, we're basically stressing the land in a way where we're adding nutrient value. Now, there's a three blade observation method that you want to understand. So you want to, the animals are, are, are cutting down a third or, 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 or as much as a half of the biomass in your field. They're crapping it out and then you're moving them to the next field. You now need a recovery cycle on that grass so that it will be able to take over the soil. The grass wants to su survive. The grass has received this pressure from the outside. Uh, it wants to survive. It will try to go to seed faster, for example. It will try to uh, put out deeper roots. And, and notice I didn't say anything about watering fields here. I didn't say anything. Once the grass is, is established, it will try to survive as long as the conditions for survival are strong. So you do still have to observe compaction. You still have to observe, observe other things. Now, if you're letting the grass rest, you don't want to bring animals back onto that grass until it has at least three true blades. So let's say the animals have eaten it down all the way down to the root nubs and you're, you've removed the animals. You want that grass to come back till it has three true blades because that's a signal that it's recovered from the pressure of the animals. Now, again, it could mean 
you're bringing uh, goats through a thinly wooded area, and then as there's more space between large trees, you're, you've seed it, you've monitored the pH, you maybe even run, run pigs through there to stir up the soil a little bit and level out the land. Uh, now you're going to have the larger animals come back through after the grass has recovered. But there is a fifth step here if you want long-term stable pastures that maybe you're going to turn your know, bale for hay or you're going to uh, rotate between animals is actually allowing the land to rest for recovery. So you don't typically want the grass to go to seed. So you will interrupt that seed cycle with other animals. But once you get a high density of grass, so in our square foot, we have a majority of that area, 60, 70, 80 percent is rooted grass. You still might have alfalfa between that. You still might have clover in between that. Um, but you may then want the grass to grow out. So we're resting it to grow out maybe hip high so that it can be baled. So let me wrap all this thing up into a seasonal example. Over the course of the year, if you have smaller animals with a shorter term, you're going to end up with a young pasture that's not going to take outside pressure. So your focus is mowing it. Your focus is uh, is flailing it to return organic material to the soil. You're monitoring pH, calcium levels. Uh, you're looking for any kind of uh, weed exchange. Then when then that's probably the spring, for example. That's probably the early summer, because again, if you're cutting the grass in the summer and you're you don't have the water taken care of, your grass will dry out. Then you're going to be putting the animals in it on the fall. The animals are going to do their business. They're going to, it's going to, they're probably going to go into winter, but you're going to have areas that you've cut in order to set aside hay for the winter. The animals are going to leave their waste on the field, which you're going to every so often drag or use chickens to spread out. Because you've slow and spread the water, those nutrients are not going to run off the soil, but instead soak into the soil. And then over the winter, the fields rest, but not a lot of growth is going on, uh, but they'll recover in the spring. Now spring is recovering and you've got that growth again. You put the animals back on the land on the second year and you just keep repeating that cycle. Now, again, what makes this more complex is it depends on how much land you have. If you've got two or three acres, that's different than 20 or 30 acres. Uh, you may need to have, depending on the number of animals you have, you may need to have 30 acres that's pretty much resting all the time and only being cut for hay and only getting a yearly or a tw every other year rotation of animals because you need that winter feed. But then again, you may be in an area where you can buy in hay. And so you're going to be moving your animals all year long and you've got smaller animals that tolerate the uh, the winter so you may even be moving them during the winter but because they're smaller animals they have less impact on the land so really if you want to make pasture it starts with a plan and i gave you the five steps here slow and spread water ph matters pasture blend rotational mob grazing resting the land uh, for recovery as long as the recovery cycles are there and you have the appropriate size animals and the appropriate number of animals, you can run a field for years. Now, I did mention uh, fields that you flood on purpose. Uh, those can start out as fields that you may cut for hay or straw, uh, but we want maximum nutrient value, maximum carbon capture, maximum sequestration into the soil so that we have a field that can handle the pressures of drought, can handle the pressures of, of large numbers of animals, and can handle the pressures that, that are necessary to kind of set up for a future uh, 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 cycles of growth. The cycles of growth is the key factor here. You need to know that land because you may not, not every field is equal. So you may end up with a with a back acreage that's wet, and so maybe that shouldn't be pasture. You may have a front acreage that's dry that might need a little bit more uh, love and care before it can tolerate animals. That is the secret of making it work. It's not a five-step approach and suddenly you're going to have a beautiful field. You may find some fields that are, are rocky and are not good for equipment, because maybe you're mowing with equipment, you may want to turn that into a pasture of wildflowers. 
and it's only you know you let animals in there once a year after the wildflowers are dead just to eat the seeds and knock everything down uh, uh, where you've excluded it from the main pasture which could be a very high quality hay a high protein hay or a uh, or even just uh, open grazing again it's very complex but I hope what I've given you here is kind of a framework to understand that you got to slow and spread that water. You can't have that water taking nutrients from your land. There are times where you may want to impound water to increase nutrient levels, but that would depend again on the soil pH. And then when you're seeding, it's not just grass, it's grass, alfalfa, clover. It could be broadleaf. Uh, it just really depends on your climate and area. And then finally, uh, you have the cycles of rotation and rest. If you don't let the land rest, it will fail. I'm Justin Hitt with Prosperity Homestead. Uh, I hope to provide you a number of introductory or high level uh, educational programs so that you can get the most from your land. If you've got land and you have a desire to raise animals and you don't know how to produce pasture, you don't know how to manage that pasture, uh, this 15 minute program isn't going to give you 100% of those answers. I would encourage you to read more, to ask more questions because a, a grassland system sequesters more carbon than a forest system. You get a different out product, but you can go as far as even a biomass product in order to make your own bedding or to uh, feed your animals across the winter with a, with a larger diversity of nutrients. You can go from deep rooted grasses to shallow rooted grasses, depending on what's needed. Um, but deep rooted grasses are actually better because again, you're pulling up those minerals, you're reducing the inputs on your property. If you have any questions about this or anything else I cover, visit us at www.prosperityhomestead.org where we have a newsletter, we have consultative services and other solutions that can be more specific to your unique needs. Go do a soil test at least. So I hope after people listen to these uh, podcasts, they actually go do something. Um, but at least do a soil test. At least go out and walk the land. Look at how the water is moving. Look at what your outcomes are. are draw up a simple plan and you will have success. You will have pastures that will be the envy of, of your neighbors that will serve you both during drought and rainy seasons and can ultimately help you increase the cal calorie count you can produce on your land. I'll see you in the next podcast. Thanks for listening.